you could help, help me take off. Just tuning into explore.org, and you're waiting for the live chat to start. We'll get started in two minutes at ten thirty Alaska time. I'm going going to be interviewing uh, Leslie Scora, who's uh, the Brooks Brooks River Bear Monitor. Uh, so stand by for that. We'll get started in just about two minutes. Like it's their dinner plate. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> All righty. Okay. Let's go ahead and get the position here. Tori, you can flip this around and make sure that we are in the right spot. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. And to my right is Leslie Scora, who's gracious enough to join us today. She has a very enviable job for a lot of Bear Camp fans out there because her full-time job is basically just to watch bears. Yes, it is. Yes, so <laughs> very glad you can join us today. She's the bear monitor here at Brooks River. Um, and on this uh, blustery, cool morning, uh, where I'm going to spend the next uh, hour or so interviewing Leslie about her job, the data that she collects, uh, maybe even take a look at one of the data sheets that you've just, uh, just made because you just finished with a monitoring session. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we will also try to take a few of your questions. If you have questions uh, for Leslie or I uh, about the bear monitoring program here, and we'll go over a lot of the basics in just a, a few minutes, uh, you can post those questions on the in the comments sec section on explore.org. And explore.org is the partner that helps to make these uh, web webcams possible. So we're very thankful that uh, they can provide this opportunity for everyone to get a bear watching experience online and get to know these bears very well. And a lot of the data that Leslie is collecting is very, very helpful to enhance your bear viewing experience overall. So again, thanks for uh, joining me today for that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, post your questions on Explore.org. If you have them, scroll to the bottom of the page and uh, post them in the comments there. There's a moderator standing by who's uh, feeding me questions, and I'll be reading those um, uh, questions uh, to Leslie in just a little bit. But I do have some, some of my own questions uh, for Leslie. A little bit of some of the basics about um, the bear monitoring program. Uh, we've done this the past couple of years or so. Uh, so we had an inter interview in 2013. We did an interview in 2014. Uh, so we're going to cover uh, some of those things, but some new topics, I think, as well uh, during that time. And it is, I should mention, it's, it's a little cold, and you've been standing out here for a couple hours. I've been standing out here for about an hour or so. So if our cheeks start to get cold, and it's difficult for us to sort of enunciate, that's why. So if we're I not, have the sniffles, yes. Yeah, yeah, so if we, you know, if we have a big drip of snot hanging off our nose and we have to wipe it, we apologize ahead of time. Um, but, uh, of course, we... Uh, and Roy and I often talk about the bear monitoring program. Uh, we, there's a bear ID book that people can download online that's based on the data that you collect and people have collected in the past. Um, so, you know, what is really the basics of the bear monitoring program here at Brooks River? Um, for example, what are you doing when you collect the data here? You know, how long does your session last? What time of the year are the sessions? 
that sort of thing. Okay, um, so overall the bear monitoring program um, tries to look at the bear distribution and use along Brooks River and it'll also um, collect information on the age and sex class class of the population of bears, so what's the ratio of males to females each year and through the years and uh, the number of sows with cubs each year and sub-adults and adults. And then it'll also look at um, the bear and human use of the river, so is, how, is there a correlation between the two um, as the n number of visitors to Brooks River increases. Um, but it'll do this by um, usually two different two sessions each day and they'll be about two to three hours each time and I'll every 10 minutes conduct a scan and record the number of bears I see and the number of people that I see and I will also record the activity of that bear so is it fishing eating a fish is it resting how it's how is it using the river that's sort of what I'm I'm looking at each time and what about the time of the year because you're not doing them in all summer there's a specific set of time that you're doing your sessions at correct yes yeah. so there's um, a July session that will start actually at the end of June um, usually it's June 27th so anytime after that and it will usually go to the end of July or perhaps okay. the first few days of August and then it will take August off since it's uh, a slower time the bears have traveled elsewhere and um, occasionally I'll get the opportunity to travel to some of these places such as the preserve this year I was able to uh, go to Moraine and Funnel Creek um, where many bears do then congregate to feed on the spawned out salmon and then I'll come back to Brooks Camp and start up in September or late August and kind of go until the beginning of October as they're back here feeding on the spawned out salmon. Yeah, and so you're uh, almost, we're almost ready to wrap up the mm -hmm. small spawn um, bear monitoring uh, session. So you, this is, I think, the time of the year maybe where it's a, a little bit harder to do the sessions because <laughs> it's cold. So Definitely. it takes a little bit of time to, or, you know, a little bit more mental preparation and maybe to focus on what's going on because it is uh, cold and blustery and exactly. dark. Yes, um, darkness is another factor, having to cut some of the sessions a yep. little shorter. And, yeah, being able to see in the low light situation, even when there is the sun is up, it's often lower on the horizon. And so getting nice photos of the bears to capture and in the fall, it becomes a little more challenging. And uh, speaking of you know different locations and going to different uh, locations, you're just not monitoring from one spot. Correct. You do it from three different locations here in the river, maybe only two in the fall though. Very true, yes. Yeah. So in July, I um, trade off between monitoring at the falls platform. Um, there's also a, a tree stand at, along the cut bank, which is mid-river, um, where I do some monitoring, and then here at the lower platform, um, and that's just in July. Uh, in the fall, I will monitor at the lower platform and at the cut bank stand. Um, the falls is less of a place where bears congregate, whereas the, the thought behind the lower river and cut bank is more dead fish will wash ashore and there's um, more bears that will be there, so it gives us a better look at the population and it's time better spent probably for me. And at the cut bank too, that's a that's a spot where we, we really haven't shown uh, Bear Camp fans a lot of images from. Uh, the, the, I think the thought behind this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe different bears use the cut bank area versus what you see up at the falls and down at the mouth of the uh, at the river. It's really not a place where people concentrate, is it? No, no. there um, there are uh, anglers that come by, and occasionally some um, photographers will will be walking the river. However, yeah, it is a, a chance to see bears and how they act without a large viewing platform and sometimes there are uh, yeah, bears that are less comfortable with, with humans that might be there. You might just see them briefly and then if they see people they might retreat. Um, it's also uh, can be a safer place for sows with cubs to fish um, since in the fall many of the larger boars will be downriver and so we'll, we'll get to see a, a little bit different activity um, and sort of remove a little bit more of the human element there. And when you are uh, 
from each one of these places, uh, you know, you're doing monitoring at the at the falls in July. You're doing monitoring at the at the Cut Bank and, and Lower River in July, and also the rest of the year too. It seems that you're covering your line of sight basically covers the whole lower half of the Brooks River. I don't. Is there a spot on the lower half of the Brooks River that you can't see from um, those locations? Nope. It, it, you're right. It is. Okay. It is pretty much covered. Some of the like the the bend in the river way um, up from here, you can barely see. It's it's a little harder to see. Um, easier to lose it happen to sleep or just be motionless for quite some time but um yes you're you're right the the whole lower river is is pretty well covered and this uh this program has been ongoing uh since the late 1980s mm -hmm. uh the the methodology i think of collecting data changed a little bit in the 1990s so maybe we can't use the early 80s data um with the 1990s data with the current year's data but it seems like the early 80s stuff and now uh is being used or is collected fairly consistently in the, in the same manner. So we have this record that goes back now, uh, coming up on 30 years of information on the individual bears that use the river here. And mm -hmm. it's it's very fascinating, I think, to find how these bears change over time in their maybe their dispositions or how they use the river. Uh, it's also really fascinating um, to see how they use different places along the river too. But it all goes back to the fact that we need to be able to identify the bears on an individual level. So how are you doing that? So if you're, you know, how do you identify the bears and what characteristics are you looking for to tell them apart? Um, so yes, the, as I've been doing this for several years now, I've learned that I should definitely not rely on a specific factor. Um, a variety is, is really key to being able to identif bear, identify bear through time. Um, but the first like most obvious that usually comes to mind is a bear's color. Um, its coat dark. Um, its ears might be blonde or um, or dark. Um, and that well, the the problem with that though is that it will change through time. In the fall, we notice that so many of the bears are darker. They've shed out their coat, so you have to learn that. Um, but typically, a bear who has light ears in July, say, will will come back okay. and intend to have light ears mm -hmm. um, and will shed and have um, a similar coat in the fall. Um, of the other side, um, male bears tending to be larger and females smaller and younger bears um, smaller. Um, and, um, excuse me, um, I'll also be um, looking at how they're fishing. So do they tend to fish at the lower river, at the falls? That's an easy place because so many bears seem to have a very specific mm -hmm, place that they mm -hmm. like to fish and will return there year after year. That's how they know how to be successful there. Um, but others might have little quirks like um, Bear 284 likes to kind of stand up every now and again. It, it almost seems like to get a, a higher view on the river to look for fish. And so you can sort of follow that characteristic through the years and, and be able to identify her based on that. Um, scars are another, are, are available to ID a bear for a, a limited amount of time. It's quite amazing how quickly they heal. So a bear that might have a scar in July, it might no longer be visible by fall, or it might be visible for a year, but then by the next year, it seems to have just kind of had hair and fur grow back so into it. The short of it, it sounds like you're looking at everything. Exactly. <laughs> There's not one, one feature that you can look for. I think some bears have very uh, diagnostic features about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only one bear that we know of right now that's missing an ear. <laughs> so you see yes. that bear, you kind of know who it is. Uh, but uh, I I think you're, you're sort of describing what I like to call the, the gestalt of the bear. You need like everything <laughs> to really know and identify these bears. Um, so you look at these uh, physical characteristics, we look at these behavioral differences in between them, uh, but you're just not writing notes down about them. I mean, that's really important. That goes mm -hmm. into the monitoring uh, data, but um, you also take photographs as well. And that, Correct. I, you find that probably helpful going back year to year and comparing photos? Yes, very helpful, because that, that will help you to really learn sort of the facial geometry as well that can help, you know, bear having closer eyes and, and getting a good close-up on, on a bear's face. Um, but in the fall, it also becomes difficult again because so often the bears are, spend their entire time in the water, head in the river, snorkeling for fish. So you always have to kind of either wait for them to look up or the, the rare opportunity when they are out walking on land. Um, but yes, the photos are very helpful. And I find the fall bears to be uh, actually really 
difficult sometimes to identify. They're just definitely. They're just big and dark, and they're in the water a lot. So mm -hmm. if you're on the cams and you see a bear in the water and you're wondering, well, who who in the world is that? We probably are also scratching our heads much of the time, thinking, <laughs> well, who in the world is that? So it's perfectly all right if you don't know a bear. Uh, I when I don't if I see a bear in the water and I don't I, I can't identify it right away. I I often just look at it and just sort of sit back and just enjoy the bear. Exactly. It's maybe a little bit different for you because you have to pay very close attention to its physical features and what it's doing, maybe identify it in the future. Um, but yeah, uh, there's there's a whole host of things that you have to look for. Look for everything to try to identify bears. Definitely. And it takes it takes a lot of time too. Was it easy for you at first? <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. I would sometimes even get nightmares. You close your eyes and an image of a bear pops in your head. You go, oh my gosh, I need to identify it. Um, and even even now, this is my third season doing this, and yeah, it, it almost becomes frustrating in the fall because you feel you should be able to identify the bear, but they've just undergone such a change, gained so much weight, have a new coat. Um, sows that are, have cubs for the first time, they may shed their coat later. Um, they may have a different shed pattern than normal, and um, they might be using the river differently now that they have to protect cubs, so it becomes a whole new element as to being able to to identify a sow with cubs. And uh, one bear in particular that looks a lot different this year versus last year, I think, is number 94. And she has yeah. two spring cubs this year. Mm -hmm. She was very fat. She was uh, around a lot last year, but I don't know how many people noticed her because she was just she was just waddle through. She's just, just another big fat bear. But now she has two cubs. We haven't seen her. I don't know if you've seen her recently. I haven't seen her in about a week. Correct. Me, me as well. Yeah, but she looks a lot different this yes. year. Um, so yeah, we we get tricked all the time. Definitely, um, it's quite common to confuse bears from time to time. And that's why it, when people ask me on the cams, uh, who's that bear? I often try to defer to you, <laughs> and we may have to wait until uh, October sometimes or late October to really uh, before you can assign a number. And that kind of gets to the next uh, couple of questions. Um, we often refer oh, to bears. <laughs> Lots of things are blowing around here, so <laughs> we apologize for the wind noise. Um, People are, we often refer to um, bears by a number, a, a lot of times they acquire an informal nickname and that seems to happen just sort of organically, but there, there's more of a rhyme and reason how they are assigned. So how do you assign numbers to um, the bears? Right, so at the, usually at the end of a, a monitoring season, so at the end of July, I will go through and each time I've identified an individual um, taken photos of it, written a description of it, and as long as it's been seen for at least two sessions, um, it will then receive a number if it is um, on its own. So cubs don't get numbers um, as long as they're under a sow's care. Um, but yes, a sub-adult and adult will that, that we ha can't um, place as a, a bear that has already been identified. Um, and numbering happens that um, each year we'll just start in a different hundred section. So last year we had like bear 500 was numbered. She was the first mm -hmm. bear that was numbered that season. And um, the next bear would have been 501 or 502 and 503. Um, and this year will be the 600s. So new bears that, um, that have been identified will be given 600 numbers. And if a number has already been used um, in the past, we won't use that number and we'll wait five years if that bear hasn't been seen until we recycle that number. Okay, people are sometimes wondering like uh, how how long would it take before we reassign like um, 608 or something like that, which is a bear that we knew for a long time here, hasn't been seen in the last few years, but maybe that number will be recycled. But we have a, there's, we don't, we don't have um, all the numbers in the 600 series occupied right now, do we? Correct. No, no okay. we don't. <laughs> okay. So there's there's quite a few numbers that are available. Um, and within that 100 series, it's it's up to you really to choose. You can just pick, um, uh, if you wanted to pick 601 or 600 or... I'll usually uh, go wherever it seems it was left off before. So okay. perhaps they started, they left off at um, the 630s, let's say. Okay. So then I would go to 640s and... Um, go through the database and see if there were any bears that started in the 640s or how many other bears there were in the 640s. Um, and then if, say, there were two other bears already identified and seen recently, I would probably then go to the 650s Okay. Um, and just kind of keep moving around. All right. <laughs> and so next year we can look forward to the 700s. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, people are always wondering about how many bears are here.
we we have rough estimates for you know uh, past years or um, not rough estimates but pretty good f estimates for past years this year I I'm always hounding you for a rough <laughs> estimate um, because people on the cams want to know so what was your sort of rough estimate for bears identified in July and what about September so far we're not through with the monitoring session yet mm -hmm. we can still have many bears showing up but what about July and September this year so July we had um, about 35 individuals that were identified um, I think about five will get new numbers okay. um, and that's either just because they might have been here in the past but we can't for sure put them ID them as a specific bear from from a year's past so it will get a new number then um, and then in the fall so far um, we've seen around 30 bears and this is a little bit up from last year but um, it's, it's slightly lower than say five years ago all right all right so we got um yeah definitely um bear numbers are a little bit lower but on par with last year it seems like mm -hmm. all right and i'm looking around i'm trying to see if there's any other any bears around i think we um, saw the south spring cub behind yep. us uh, i think uh people might want to take uh, a look maybe at one of your monitoring uh, sheets and see what sort of data you actually are collecting we talked a little bit about that um earlier but it might help to um to be helpful to see an example of that sure so <laughs> It blew on the ground here. Exactly. <laughs> and if we're um, behind behind the camera here is uh, Tori Anderson, who's volunteering for the bear monitoring program right now. So we might uh, have her zoom in on this monitoring sheet and take a look. Probably not the greatest handwriting since it was very frigid and windy today. But yes, please <laughs> no, do not judge the penmanship. <laughs> And not the most active okay. uh, active days. Hopefully we can sort of... So hopefully you can see this um, on the cam <laughs> here. Um, it looks like you... It looks uh, like chicken scratch. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I can make sense of it, I guarantee you. <laughs> so it looks like you did your uh, your first scan, and you said you did them every uh, every 10 minutes. Um, Correct. So your first scan was at 8.10, and you started your session at 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was only one bear maybe that you saw at that time? Correct. So uh -huh. um, just as, I guess we'll just kind of move left to right. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah, we have this people section, so I'll identify if there's there are anglers, maybe other people, uh, photographers, or just bear viewers or even park service staff that are on the ground and then on is for if i'm on one of the platforms how many other people are on there with me um and the sort of little subdivided sections are because i will scan below the bridge and record as one sector and then above the bridge is another sector just to okay. kind of differentiate um so yes at, at 8 10 there was one bear fishing um, I identified it as bear 289, and um, I also, at the bottom, have then taken some photos that I record that's bear 289, and if it's the first time I've seen her um, this this year, I'll, I'll write a description, especially if it's a bear I can't identify. I will be vigorously writing notes, trying to, uh, you know, write uh, how, what its ear shape and, and all the, the characteristics I had mentioned before about trying to be able to identify a bear. Um, and th we also have a separate section for uh, females with cubs, that's what it stands for, and females with yearlings. Mm -hmm. um, any activity. So at 8.40, uh, we did have a sow with a yearling move through. Um, I wasn't able to identify her because that was the one that was had been shown earlier. So I wrote the number two and I was just going to kind of reference more um, and write have descriptions and and Tori the volunteer has taken some photos so we'll be able to look back and kind of go through our database of, of other photos and bear descriptions um, to be able to hopefully okay. identify or give her a new number and then one other thing maybe uh, that we have on the sheet here that's kind of important um, is what zone the bear is using oftentimes mm -hmm. uh, that's the the river here is divided up into different zones depending on where you're at and what are we which zone would we be in down here if a bear was downstream of the bridge right so yeah, yeah. that would be the uh, it would be zone three okay um so yeah like i was saying the the below the bridge would be the lower zone and then above is uh sec or zone four okay um and it's same at the cut bank there's um, basically the riffles are their own zone and then everything below it is sort of a, a mega zone. <laughs>
So you have, I don't, how many of the, these data sheets do you end up collecting throughout the course of the summer? You have two to three sessions a day Correct. for July, two to three sessions for, you know, September and October. So I guess you could easily multiply, you know, three times 60, and it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of data sheets. And sometimes it gets really, really busy with bears. How long does it take you to really enter this data into the, into the computer, into the database? Um, it takes a good while, especially because there's almost, well, there, there are two separate databases that I'm working with. One is just entering that there was one bear fishing, and, or like U stands for two bears that I couldn't, identified their activity perhaps they were standing behind a, a clump of grass I could just I knew there was a bear there okay. but I didn't know what it was doing okay. um, or standing um, and so basically that one is dealing with just pure numbers and what the activity is and then the second uh, database is more along the lines of, of the bear book and that's going to be how many of the bears this season are male and female and which ones were identified, how many individuals were identified um, and sows with cubs and so that's sort of what will be written more down here. Um, when did we first see that bear in a monitoring session? Um, you know, did it arrive late or early or early or late in the season? Um, so yeah, it's it's almost like I have to enter each sheet twice. Um, so it takes it takes okay. a good amount of time. <laughs> That's usually what I end up doing in October or in August if I'm not doing um, any uh, monitoring somewhere else. It's just data entry. <laughs> yeah, and this is I guess a a, a reason why um, often we don't know or I can't uh, glean the information from you right away like we want. Exactly, um, yes. Because it does take a lot of time to enter that data. So thanks for sharing that, <laughs> that sheet with us. Uh, before we get to some viewer questions, and we'll try to get to those um, in just a moment, I have one more question for you. Um, what was uh, one memorable non-bear wildlife sighting that you've had this year? Uh, you get to sit on the river a lot. You travel to Moraine and Funnel Creek. Um, and got to watch bears up there in August. Um, so bears are really fun to watch, but you got to see there must be other critters that show up from time to time too. It is. Um, it, it was a great year for some some other wildlife viewings. I know we had a, a wolf around the Oxbow Island um, June and July, so that was really exciting to see. Um, but I would say that I was definitely very excited to have my very first wolverine sighting while I was at the preserve um, monitoring at oh, and, okay. and, uh, um And yeah, I, it was uh, a day when I was getting um, a new assistant to help me with the monitoring. And um, I was, we were climbing a hill, kind of getting the lay of the landscape. I was showing around, and just on the back side of the hill, there was something sort of running along side by, by some shrubs. And I, I had always wanted to see one. It was kind of one of those species on my life list. And so I couldn't even remember the word wolverine, but I just, like, tackled my partner. I was like, oh, my gosh, there's, there's, ah, wolverine. <laughs> That's what it is. And so we stood still and kind of watched it, and it jogged along a little bit, stopped and looked at us, and then eventually jogged on down and took probably some blueberry patches or <laughs> into the shrubs. A lot, of, a lot of ground squirrels up in that habitat? Yes, Okay, so maybe well. it was out on a yes, patrol? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's fascinating to, to stand out here and, and watch the bears, but um, I think it's an important lesson is to be looking for the, a lot of the other things that may show up because you just don't know. There could be a wolf. There could be a giant moose that walks through, and we've seen that a couple times exactly. this year. Exactly. Or, or you get really lucky and you see something awesome like a, like a wolverine. Yes. So, so uh uh, I think those are most of the questions um, that I wanted to ask about the uh, the bear monitoring session. I know that there are some viewer questions in our queue, um, so we'll try to get to those over the next uh, half hour or so. Um, and if you're joining us late, uh, my name is Mike Fitz. I'm a park ranger at Katmai National Park and Preserve, and today I'm interviewing uh, Leslie Scora, who's uh, the Brooks River Bear Monitor. Uh, she's done this the past three seasons, and she's giving us um, a bit of her time to give you some insight into the monitoring program and the data that it's that is collected. Um, if you do, uh, we have a lot of questions in our queue. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. If you have some additional questions for us, uh, please post them in the chat board on explore.org. Uh, on any bear cam page, scroll down to the bottom of the screen and you can post the questions uh, there for us. Uh, so let's see here. Um, there's at least 12 in the queue already, and I'm sure there's probably hundreds, hundreds more posted in the chat, so we're not going to be able to get to them all. Um, 
Let's see. I think a, a, few, a lot of these we ended up covering at, at the beginning. Um, but uh, the second question here in the in the queue um, I'm seeing is maybe one that we you kind of touched on just a little bit. But are, are bears monitored in areas other than at Brooks River? Uh, you mentioned going to Katmai National Preserve. Mm -hmm. So what's it like up there? Uh, can you kind of describe that the habitat up there, the terrain, and what you're actually collecting? What sort of data you're you're collecting up there? Sure. Um, so at the at the preserve, it's um, a lot more open tundra. Um, so I was kind of compare it to if you're if you were able to climb up on top of Mount Dumpling behind us. That's it's a great tundra scape, and, and the landscape is. Very similar to that, um, only it's it's sort of a a valley that has a a river running through at the base, and then the kind of mountains um, along the side, and it becomes great uh, salmon fishing habitat. And there's a number of bluffs that overlook the river, and we've chosen two sites um, on the top of these bluffs to to look um, and and monitor bears. Similarly to how we do here, we. Um, we didn't break it into different zones. It was just uh, purely a matter of how many bears are there. And we record very similarly that what the bear's activity is, is it fishing, eating a fish, or interacting. Um, this year, I recorded a number of, um, of different bears playing. They seemed very fat, happy, and content okay. at, at the preserve. So sometimes we'd have even like four, usually younger bears, um, so sub-adults. Um, just playing with each other out in the open it seemed to to go on for half an hour or more at least um, and um, there we're not able to identify individual bears and number them like we do here just because we only get such a, a small window of opportunity I was only there for two weeks um, and and so there it's it's just more of a matter of recording how many females we can identify how many males how many sows with cubs um, how many cubs that sow does have, and if they're spring or yearling. So we try to still get the the population demographics that way. But and and we'll take photos. But it's it's a lot harder to to identify a bear just in a, such a, a small window of time. And uh, I, there as far as I know, there's no other places that you go to and collect data like that in the park. It's just Moraine and Funnel Creek for a brief period of time a year. Correct. Uh, and there is um, also another program. Um, on the, the Pacific side of the park, the Changing Tides Project, um, but that's uh, different. They're actually radio collaring bears out there, mm -hmm. trying to gain some information about um, their their food habits and reproductive rates and, and things like that. Um, so we are collecting data about bears in other places in the park, but very sporadic. Um, we don't know, like um, a lot of the bears here go to Margo Creek, mm -hmm. um, but we've uh, we don't go there. We don't specifically collect data. Um, so, so yeah, yes and no. We, we collect data other places, and um, like Moraine and Funnel, but we don't go to all the places here, here exactly. in the park. Um, question about um, number five zero three. Uh, a favorite on the cam. He was adopted by four thirty five Holly last year. Uh, is he the youngest bear? You know, you and a number two, and um, will he keep his number? if he comes back next year as an independent bear. I got you, yes. Um, so, so far, yes, he, he is the, the youngest bear who, who I've given a number to. Um, and that was because yet last year he was on his own for several weeks, and he was recorded in multiple different sessions as a lone and independent bear, even though he was just a yearling at the time. Um, so he, he was numbered, given the number 503 for the July monitoring session, and then when he came back in August, lo and behold, yeah, he was adopted by Holly. So he became a dependent bear. Again, he wasn't counted as a, a separate individual in, um, in the population makeup at Brooks River. However, um, he will probably keep 503 as his number. Um, and and so yeah, next year if we can identify him as, as an individual sub adult, he'll he'll supposed to be five oh three. That's the trick. We have to be able to identify him <laughs> yes. next year, and and uh, we'll see. We'll see if he can even comes back too. Exactly. Um, we're you know every year I think uh, you and I kind of wonder. Well, what about this bear? And there may be a question in here. I I'm not sure, but would there be a question um, about uh, uh, Divot's uh, former cub from last year? Mm -hmm. If you've seen it or not. Um, I, I don't know if I've seen it. I don't know if you've had um, an inkling if there may be I'm pretty, running around or not. Yeah, pretty sure it'll get a number for July because I was 
fairly confident, at least, you know, it's its own individual now. So whether or not it, it truly is Divot's Cup, we can't 100% uh -huh. say for sure. However, um, there it was at least a, a very fitting sub-adult okay. that will probably get a number for July, but I can't say for sure if it was around in the fall session. Okay. And um, some people saw you and Tori sitting on the cut bank stand on the on the <laughs> falls cam yesterday, and they were wondering who was that bear that was sitting down below you, <laughs> and how long did you have to wait? Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. We've had several several bears, but yeah, there was um, yeah last time there was a small smaller sub adult um, who hasn't officially gotten a number for a while, uh, or. Um, but yeah, it was sitting down there for a while. Um, luckily, I think that one was able to move along before we had to, uh, before the, it was the end of the session. Um, but yeah, it's, it does get rather tricky, um, especially in the fall when so many bears just kind of like to sit up on the, the bank and, and just sort of watch the fish, watch four dead fish going by or just take naps. Um, yeah, we also had Holly and, and company sort of hang out beneath us for a while, and that was at the end of a session. So. Dory and I were just kind of hoping for a window of opportunity to be able to go home, and um, especially when it's getting darker out. That's always the challenge, and yes. not getting stranded in the dark on a, on a tree stand in the woods. Yeah, because <laughs> there's no there's no trail or anything that goes to the tree stand except the bear trail that you follow each and every day. Yes. So you have to you have to basically bushwhack your way to the tree stand and in the dark. I'm not sure how fun that is. <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> definitely not. And it's slippery and full of roots, and we do encounter bears on the trail. At, on occasion, and so it's it's not something I would really want to do in the dark. <laughs> and uh, we we talked a little bit about bear numbers earlier, and how many bears are um, here in July and in the fall. Um, but how many? A uh, rough estimate, how or maybe even if you could say it's um, less than a majority or a majority of the bears that are, that you've seen this year are the same bears that we saw last year. Um. Yes, I would say a majority um, were the same as last year. I think occasionally you get bears that have skipped a year or two. Like mm -hmm. we, I might have, I know that there, there was, I think a couple um, that I had seen in 2013 that hadn't seen in 2014, but were were seen again. Um, and so yeah, we will get that occasionally. And then um, there's also the, the just the factor of how many bears in the fall were. July, um, and a good number are the same, but there's definitely different ones or bears that we can't quite connect that that is the same bear as a July bear that we've identified, so always a challenge. <laughs> and of course, I think a lot of people are jealous that you get to watch bears so, so much, um, and you get to observe them. Uh, fairly closely, you get to hear them as well. Maybe that's something that you know we don't uh, keep watching on the cam. very much for a variety of reasons um, but what do you when you hear something like a mother um, making noise uh, in your professional opinion uh, would, a, would the mother bear make noise so that that cubs know when to come to to her like does she call them back does she make noise to uh, warn them to pay attention or uh, do the cubs warn the mother what you know what have you sort of observed when a mom and a cub sort of interact vocally Gotcha. Yes, um, we do get to hear to hear the. It's pretty uh, pretty remarkable. Um, but yes, I'd say often it's it's the the sow, the mother, who makes noise, and it's usually sort of a huffing noise to her cubs, um, it, or it might start as huffing, and then if if it's more of a threat, then we'll hear jaw popping. Um, but that's usually the sound that that sort of alerts the cubs that hey, something's not right, let's all either group up or move on, follow me. Um, occasionally, I'll hear cubs make the same noise. If they are suspicious of something, um, they'll often be standing up, looking around, trying to look over this tall grass that we have. Um, and so they, they might occasionally huff out to kind of say, like, whoa, you know, like, mom, there's something a little questionable out there. Or even just to each other, if one's fallen behind, I've heard them just sort of huffing. But it's something you really have to listen for it's it's not like you'll hear roaring or growling usually it's it's usually pretty kind of discreet and I I, I was surprised that uh, bears are pretty quiet 
overall. Yes. You know, when you watch television shows, it, they're always making noise. They're always like <laughs> grumbling or making some sort of vocalization. But I don't, I don't know how often you hear that. It, for me, I don't, I don't hear vocalizations all that often. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Usually, it's it's either two two dominant bears just kind of arguing over a fish or a fishing area, or occasionally. Um, I know yearlings kind of tend to make maybe a little bit more noise when they're fighting amongst each other for fish. They might just kind of let out a, a whale grumble. And it, it can sometimes sound terrifying, like they're they're attacking each other. But really, it's just it's just a little sibling rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> like all all siblings love to do. So. Uh, People are wondering a little bit about your background. Um, you know, how did you get interested in being a, a bear monitor? And you know, what's your what's your education? How did you? What's your short story of coming to Katmai? I guess. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's so many uh, park rangers don't seem to have a short story. It's it's all a, a, a weird web of of being able to to end up where you are. Um, but I have um, a degree, a bachelor's degree in natural resource management, and. Um, through summers and tried to gain experience, uh, yes, during school and after school, um, after I graduated. Um, my first job was working at Glacier Bay National Park for um, a master's student who was studying Kitlitz and Murlet, and um, I was able to help him and, and work closely with the park, however it was it was actually for the grad student who I was working. Um, and afterwards I stayed on to volunteer at the park service and I volunteered for the um, the bear management people that were there and there was also a grad student doing a project on uh, bear genetic studies. Okay. And so I went and collected hair samples from rub trees that he had marked. And uh, so that kind of got my foot in the door with studying bears and with working with the park service. and. Um, was then able to uh, prove myself worthy um, of, to work for this organization and was able to get hired on the following year at Glacier Bay and and um, after that it, it led to me getting the job here so it's it's yeah a matter of showing you're, you're dedicated um, through volunteering and, and a good worker and um, and then gaining experience through through those either volunteering or finding jobs and in and, and winter work as well. Yeah, often I, I think, and, and most I, I think park staff will say that they, they started out maybe not in the position that was perfect for them right away. Mm -hmm. um, you, or maybe you just had to, to volunteer uh, at, a, at a task um, somewhere, somewhere else. Excuse me, I could feel a little bit of <laughs> snot running down my nose there. Well, hopefully that didn't show on the camp. But... Uh, um, yeah, you often do have to uh, volunteer at a position somewhere else. Uh, it can give you that foot in the door, that worthwhile experience, um, and then you you have other opportunities open up to you. So uh, we're yeah. we're glad you're here. We're glad that you're continuing the monitoring program because it's a very important program for the public um, and for the managers that are that are here. So anyone who's out there who's interested in doing wildlife work, I think you can look up to someone like Leslie and all the biologists who are working for the Park Service because um, you know maybe you can't get what you want right away, but you, if you work at it, then you can find these uh, really fantastic positions mm -hmm. um, that are extremely worthwhile and are very very valuable to helping to help protect uh, the wildlife that we have here in the parks. Um, how many, uh, you know, uh, another question here uh, about the ninth in our queue here, um, how many adult bears have you seen so far this year that have not been identified? Sort of rough estimate. Um, so there were about five in July, um, although I think a couple of those were sub-adults, so we'll say around three, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's, gosh, a little bit harder for the fall, um, because like I said, I may not initially identify a bear, but I'll take photos and, and <coughs> write a description and then go back to, um, to previous year's, um, data that we have and, and look at those photos, and I might be able to match it up then. Um, but I'd say maybe more like five to seven in the fall okay. of unidentified adults. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to look in the database <laughs> and I say, well, she said five to seven, and I only see three here. Where are the other two bears? Exactly. So. The other factor, though, is I have to wait till some of them are, are seen in a second session. I might yeah. see them in one session, so they're, they're kind of put a little asterisk by them, and, and if I see them again, we'll, we'll then 
notes them worthy of obtaining a number. <laughs> and some, some bears, uh, it's also important to note, too, aren't, aren't seen in session at all. They might be seen on the cams. Very true. Or I might see them when I'm out here just bear watching in my off time. Uh, but if they're not seen in a session, they don't make it into the database. We might um, take you know, I might take a picture of it, but mm -hmm. for the all due purposes, it's going to remain an unknown bear. One of the other 2,200 bears <laughs> that, are, that are here in Katmai National Park. Uh, and another kind of question about identifying bears specifically, um, what, you know, how would you determine the relative age of a bear based on its, its physical characteristics. Um, we know that if we see a bear year after year after year, we can get a pretty precise estimate of how old it is. Mm -hmm. But if you're seeing a bear for the first time, how would you really differentiate between a sub-adult bear and an adult bear, for instance? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, that can be very difficult. Um, for the most part, um, it'll, it'll be done by size and, and behavior. Um, so the sub-adults will be smaller, and they, they tend to act more skittish. Um, once once they're out on the own, their own for the first time, they no longer have their mother's protection, and they're they're really at at the the bottom of the hierarchy in the bear world, where they're going to have to compete with larger and adult bears um, for fishing spots and food resources. So they'll often get picked on and just kind of chased out. So they're going to be very wary of other bears in the area. Um, so if if they see another bear or maybe even just catch wind of, of a bear through um, smelling it, they might take off either running or, or just kind of creep back into the, the grasses. Um, they'll also be a little bit more playful sometimes um, if they are able to, to find a sub-adult and, and, and recognize that it, it's not a threat to them. We'll often see them either playing with each other or just be curious about their environment. Um, those tend to be the bears that find one of the overhanging trees along the river that we kind of call, have nicknamed trampoline uh -huh. trees, where they'll they'll climb onto it and just start bouncing on it and, and testing the limits of of the world around them, or even like hanging from it, or chewing and playing on a stick. And so it's kind of just that that playful attitude um, that'll tend to get a bear labeled as, as a sub-adult as opposed to adult, but it is, isn't a black and white sort of um, designation. We can we might put um, in the, the record books that it was borderline sub-adult or adult if, if we just weren't sure, and that might mean that it's, it's maybe five or six years old, maybe four, we're not quite sure, but um, yeah, it's, it's... It's hard to tell. Exactly. Okay, and uh, really mature adults, you can Usually, usually pick those out pretty easily. Right, those, they'll tend to um, be able to, to put on a really good fat, fat, fat supply in the fall. Um, they'll usually be larger and just kind of more confident with their set routine of fishing and and um, yeah, may, maybe more able to stand their ground if approached by another bear. Okay, and uh, the people two seven three in our cub. Of course, are, are very uh, very well known on the cams. I mean, they're around a lot. They're very conspicuous. Uh, Roy and I have uh, talked about them on the cams quite a bit um, because of their behavior and conspicuousness. Um, so, when would and we covered this a little bit? But w let's say when would that cub get assigned a number? Not anytime soon, if I read you correctly, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, no, it it would get a number um, when it's it's sort of chased off by its its mother and on its own so usually that happens when it's a two-year-old um, it, it they'll normally just arrive here at Brooks River as an independent um, cub and, and there won't be much interaction between the former cub now sub-adult and its mother um, but like in the case of 503, um, that happened as a yearling, or, or perhaps if they were to be separated, um, it, it could even happen this year. Um, but yeah, it, it won't get a number until it's on its own. So probably a couple more years. Yes. I think that's yeah. what people are waiting for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, he'll uh, er, er, he or she, um, and we're not sure about the sex. That was the other thing we were talking Correct. about before. Yep. We, um, I know a lot of bear camp fans are pretty convinced it's a male, but we have not seen conclusive evidence here. Um, so we're still wondering whether or not it's male or female. We'll keep watching. Yep. <laughs> and we'll get you an answer if we know for sure. But right now, I'm still calling it 
it. Yes. Yeah, so 273's <laughs> cub is an it right now. I'm not sure if it's it's male or female. Uh, let's see. Uh, are there any bears that um, have surprised you because they've changed so much in their appearance from July to September? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, um, some, uh, gosh, I can't can't quite think of an example yet, but, well, now I can. So, like, 94, mm -hmm. um, who we didn't see this July, but this year when we did see her in, in the fall, just looked drastically different. I mean, normally she just, she's round, fat, and happy, and just kind of walks out on the spit and, and plunks down and either stares sort of dreamily into the water and, and or is, is fishing in the lower river. Um, but, yeah, this year... There's there's no bear sitting on the spit, and it said she has cubs, and and is was had much uh, a shorter coat and even blonder than I had ever seen in years past. Um, so it was really only due to like distinct kind of facial geometry and and how her her forehead looks and and kind of the how her her muzzle sort of upturns that we were able to determine that it was her. Um, so it, it it is really remarkable how much they change just from July to fall um, and year to year um, it's always hard then going because your last mental image of the bears is in the fall when they're you know several hundred pounds heavier and then when you next see them it's it's in June or July again and they've lost that weight yeah, they they're just shed, shrunk. <laughs> exactly they're shedding their coats so they're a lot lighter and shaggy and patchy so it's it's a challenge, yes. <laughs> and I think we look forward to seeing these bears um, come back year after year. But uh, first time I look at a lot of the bears, I'm like, I should know that one, but I don't <laughs> know who that is because they do they do end up changing uh, so much. Yes. Uh, do you have any um, any uh, funny uh, bear identification um, you know situations that you've seen? Have you seen the bears do anything that? you know surprised you or you thought was humorous oh gosh all the time i'd say <laughs> I, I love it when they play with sticks and <laughs> and uh and bounce on trees and stuff um at, at the preserve um this this past august where there were so many playful sub adults there was one uh young female that would often go down to the river find a fish but then climb all the way back up the the steep 20 foot bank and just she would lay on her back and just like sort of juggle and play with this fish she would maybe take a little nibble but she wasn't really eating the fish just <laughs> off her while still on her back so it was it was um like a, a kid playing with food basically so <laughs> you definitely see some of the the fun goofy characteristics that some of these bears have yeah you watch them long enough and certainly they uh they they show their inquisitive and curiosity um their, their curious nature mm -hmm. um very well it's it's easy to see um why you can we see that all the time here and i think people on the camps get to see that uh, quite a bit too uh uh, no pine martens this year. People are wondering no, about that. Okay. Unfortunately, no. Okay. I keep on hoping for it, but they're so uh, so elusive. They don't usually like to to be around humans, and and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure as soon as they hear me or anyone coming, they just kind of scurry or, or back into a hiding spot or just kind of remain hidden. Yeah, and if you're not sure of what um, you know we're referring to, in uh, in 2013 I asked Leslie the question if you've had any memorable wildlife sightings, um, and the, her answer was a, a pine martin yes. that you saw at the cut bank, right? Exactly, okay. yes. So, and uh, as we had discussed uh, earlier, that bears are so quiet um, that often when a, a bear comes up either behind me at the cut bank stand or, or passes underneath, you, you hardly hear it. You may just hear the grass is kind of like swaying or swooshing, um, but I had heard something behind me that was was a little bit louder than that, or just like more screeching and scurrying. Um, that that wouldn't have been a bear, but was probably something at least larger than a squirrel, perhaps. And um, yeah, looked around and, and right at the base of the pine martin that just kind of and uh, and we just had shared a little moment of like, oh my gosh, ah, and then it it, it scurried away after. 
of several seconds, I guess, but very exciting for yeah, me. So I, I have not seen a Pine Martin here in Katmai. I'm still looking for one. That's one on my list. So I, I, they, they of course, like to eat um, small rodents and medium-sized rodents like squirrels. Mm -hmm. And we've, there's not too many squirrels because there haven't been too many cones the past uh -huh. few years. Yes. So I'm wondering if maybe there's just not a lot of Pine Martins around for that reason. But they can make a living eating other things, too. Yep. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, do you have a? Uh, so we're coming up on on the end of the 2015 season here. Do you have like a um, like a bear watching highlight for yourself? We talked. To, you, you mentioned a lot of those bears up at Moraine and Funnel Creek playing with one another. Mm -hmm. um, so that certainly sounds like it was a highlight for you. Do you have anything here along the Brooks River that was particularly memorable uh, as far as bears go oh, in their behavior? Gosh. Um, having um, Bear 775, uh, nicknamed Lefty, uh, jump off the lip of the falls oh, yes. and belly yeah, flop. So fun. That was, yeah. yeah, that was pretty remarkable. I would love it if he kept doing that, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, and gosh, I think just yeah, maybe either that or seeing um, 402's four cubs. They once all climbed up the same tree, so it's just kind of like a a cubsicle stick that was that was rather okay. adorable just <laughs> like watching cubs be cubs but uh yeah usually those two moments but yeah gosh there's just so many fun moments you can have when there's either yeah, nobody about or even a platform full of people just yeah to be able to to kind of sit and quietly watch these bears behave and interact is is always <laughs> a joy <laughs> And uh, we have, um, I think, just a few more minutes left in the, in the chat here. Um, we do have a, a few more questions uh, to get to. One of these uh, questions um, is about the, the series of numbers that are assigned to bears. There, uh, and in the monitoring database, I don't know if there are any, any bears in the 900 series. Do you know why, if there are any? I, um, I can't recall. We have a lot right. in the 800s. Um, yeah, I can't recall They may have just skipped well. the year. It, it uh, is possible. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't think there would be any specific reason why we wouldn't number bears in the 900s. Um, so two years from now, we, we might just do that. Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's something to look forward yes. to. We can have number 999 or something yeah. like that. I don't think you're going to do a bear number 666, are you? <laughs> um, I, I guess it's, it's still open, but, okay. you know, if if, uh, if if there was a bear that was fitting enough, maybe maybe we would. Okay. Yeah, that might, uh, that might uh, people might look at that bear in a different way. That yeah. might be a number that does have a lot of meanings associated with it. True. So we might, maybe that's a number that we could, you can go from 665 to 667 yeah. or something like that. Uh, for you, um, you know, on the cams, it's it can be difficult to identify it can uh, uh, bears because uh, you know it's not as clear as what we're seeing with the naked eye or through our binoculars here. Um, but for you, is there a bear that's particularly difficult to identify that every time you look at it, you know, you have to take a second look and then it's like and then it hits you. Oh, I knew it was that bear. But is there a certain bear that does that to you each and every time? Whew. Uh, th there's probably many at this point, especially in the fall when they're all returning and some are new and some are the same. Um, gosh, anyone in particular? Sometimes just seeing um, Bear 503, now that he's a little bit more dependent, I'll, I'll sometimes see him first before I'll see Holly and, and the yearling cub. And he's been even just playing with other young away from um, Holly, and it's it's a little, I, I kind of have to double take if he's not with that group as to like, which bear is that? I've never seen that one before until he sort of gets back up, and then I'm like, oh, wow. Um, so yeah, that can be challenging. Um, otherwise, sometimes it's just the bears that aren't, aren't as, as visible, aren't as present that show up a few times throughout the season that you don't get a good look at how they're changing weekly or even mm -hmm. day to day. Those can be a challenge. Um, yeah, I can't think of any other specific bears, but there's definitely <laughs> definitely challenges. All right. And uh, last question here. Did you, um, did you uh, get a chance to see any of the moose that have walked through this year? Um, no. I think I just saw one up at 
Brooks Lake, but unfortunately I missed the moose that was on okay. Grassy Knoll and some of the other ones. That was very sad because I, I saw some photos and that and one you have not, really So neat. you have not seen any bears interacting with moose here? I uh, haven't, whichever. no. All right. Not this, this yeah, season we, or any season. We don't see too many moose around here. I think the f the few that we've seen this year is kind of above average for the number of sightings. So. Right, yes. It's been more than I've seen in years yeah. past, so it's uh, exciting. So something to look forward to if you're looking forward to more um, to see how bears and, and moose interact with one another. Just I guess just keep watching. That's mm -hmm. maybe the only way to find out. So you might see some things on the cams that Leslie or I uh, don't or miss out here on, on the river. So, but yeah, it's almost uh, 11.30 uh, Alaska time, uh, so we've been online for about an hour. I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, uh, we'll do this again some other time. Maybe Sounds next year great. we'll do the, the, <laughs> annual, the annual interview with Leslie Scora. Again, if you're just joining us late, Leslie Scora has been my guest. She is the Brooks River Bear Monitor, um, and she collects uh, data up and down the river here. Uh, very specific data that helps to Brooks uh, River in helps uh, park managers uh, uh, monitor trends in the bear population and activity. Um, one more uh, Brooks Camp uh, uh, live chat before we uh, um, we go home, uh, or back to King Salmon at least, uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the week here. So we'll be uh, for a time and a day to be determined, but that's coming up. Um, yeah, but thanks uh, one more time, and uh, Thank you. we'll talk to everyone uh, sometime later this week.